introduce Paul Robertson, who's going to talk to us about a very interesting subject matter, uh, bats that are one of our evening, nighttime creatures that are very misunderstood, and he's going to straighten that out for us. Paul? Thank you, Mary. Uh, I, I think when people hear uh, that sort of long list of jobs, they probably think, poor guy, couldn't, can't, couldn't hold a job. <laughs> Okay, can everybody hear me nicely? Mm -hmm. I have a sort of a booming voice, so uh, if I see you going like that, I'll know I'm talking too loud. Let me, let me grab my, uh, my crib notes here. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for coming out this evening. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I hope um, you'll go away with a, a great deal more knowledge uh, about bats than when you came in, although some of you may be given uh, all the really wonderful TV programs that are available nowadays. Uh, people know a whole lot more about bats uh, than they used to. Uh, and there was a time, not very, very long ago, when uh, uh, bats were just a, a simply uh, a noxious uh, uh, animal that, uh, that people uh, uh, tolerated on, on occasion as long as they didn't get too close to them. Um, I want to uh, I want to start off by thanking uh, the uh, staff at Bat Conservation International for furnishing me with uh, the slides, uh, most of the slides that, I, that I'm going to show tonight. Um, I worked there, when I worked there in uh, 1988 and 89, um, I was the number three employee. And uh, when we hired a fourth employee, I got to be executive director. Uh, you know. <laughs> And two years later, when I left, uh, there, were, there were 13 employees, and now I think they're up to around 40, and uh, certainly have, have made a, a tremendous impact uh, on uh, the uh, conservation of bats, uh, not only in the United States, uh, but worldwide. Uh, when I started putting this um, program together, um, sorting through a bunch of slides, et cetera, the one I chose to put up on the, on the screen uh, tonight to say, sort of to start the whole thing off was, was this, uh, this photo of uh, Bracken Cave, which is located uh, south of uh, Austin, Texas, uh, uh, about uh, 15 or 20 miles. Have any of you ever been to Bracken Cave? Uh, well, I, I think it's one of the, uh, certainly one of the seven natural wonders of the, at least the United States, if not the world, because it contains the largest colony of bats uh, in the United States and one of the largest colonies in the world. They estimate the number at somewhere between uh, 10 and 40 million. Uh, uh, and, and you'll see in a second uh, why it's very, very, uh, if you ever sat there and tried to count them when they're all coming out over a two-hour period of time during the summer, um, you'll, you'll see why it's so difficult. And they've never really uh, been able to figure out how to, to, uh, to count bats, but <clears throat> in, that, in those numbers. Um, Anyway, this, is, uh, this cave is in, in the hill country. And the reason I chose this slide to start it off with is because uh, caves uh, are very much like bats in that they're, they're sort of mysterious. Uh, they're, they're a little bit uh, scary. Uh, at the same time, they're, they're something that attracts us to them. And they're, they're really, and that this, the same thing is true of bats. Despite the uh, really, really terrible PR job that's been done on bats, uh, which we get to confront every Halloween, and of course uh, uh, now we have uh, the, there's this association between uh, bats and uh, Dracula, and so now we actually have all these TV programs, and yeah, they're sort of romanticizing bats, and they get the good-looking girls now. So maybe uh, in the near future, uh, bats will fare better as, as well. So. This is the emergence of bats at Bracken Cave, and uh, this, goes, uh, this uh, goes on for um, about two hours, uh, sometimes as much as three hours, and, and uh, uh, it, it's very, very hot in the cave, and, and uh, as the summer progresses, uh, the bats tend to come out earlier and, uh, and earlier, as much as two hours before dark. Um, and uh, these are almost all female bats, and I'll talk about that uh, more in a few minutes and show you some, uh, some pictures. Uh, but I, what I'm hoping is that um, that you will make an emergence tonight by the end of the talk and that you will emerge uh, uh, enlightened, if you will, just as these bats are, relative to uh, the real value of bats and the beauty of bats, as, as I hope I will be able to illustrate to you. 
Um, this is a group of people, uh, Bat Conservation International leads tours to Bracken Cave, and I'm, I'm really happy to say that um, I wasn't around when Bracken Cave was, uh, was finally purchased by Bat Conservation International, but I was there in the early years when, when we knew that that's what we needed to do. And, uh, and so it's now owned by Bat Conservation International. Uh, just a, a quick aside, Bracken Cave holds a really special place in my heart because uh, very, very early in my uh, relationship with uh, my now wife, Life, um, we, uh, we stopped by Bracken Cave on the way from California, driving from California to Gansville, Florida, and uh, we were just like these people. We were out sitting, sitting there, and the bats are, are just within a few feet of you, and I just stood up and snapped a bat right out of the air uh, to show it to her, and et cetera, and she, she told me uh, a few years later that that was sort of the moment she said, this is the guy for me. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Which tells you what sort of a strange woman she is and, and what a strange relationship we have. Anyway, uh, so, okay. Well, I started thinking about bats and, and what, I, what I wanted to tell you about them. Um, and, and this is, this, uh, for those of you who are not into keying out species of mammals, this is a human. And uh, <clears throat> this turns out, to, this is Bram Stoker. And uh, he, he was the guy, he was the, he is the Scottish poet uh, who wrote the original uh, Dracula uh, book in the in the late 1800s, and uh, and the reason I'm going through this this early part is because the primary problem for bats there's all kinds of reasons that bats um, have suffered from a conservation and protection standpoint, and it has to do almost entirely with human perception. Okay, we're doing a lot of specific things that have really uh, been very negative to bat populations worldwide, but it's that perception really that, that leads to us doing those, those sorts of things. Okay, um, so uh, what, uh, what uh, Bram Stoker did was he, he took uh, three different things and, and he combined, melded them together into a book. And one of the things that, one of those three things is this guy, and this is Vlad the Impaler. And he was a Transylvanian uh, feudal prince, a really, really horrible, terrible person. He liked to have lunch while he had people impaled on stakes by the hundreds so he could, so he could view them. So he was really, really terrible. And he really did live in Transylvania. It, it really is a place, et cetera, in Romania. Um, and, and uh, Bram Stoker combined that with uh, the tales of the living dead. During the bubonic plagues, during the, uh, during the dark ages, um, people, would, they would think they were dead, and then they would suddenly sit up and try to walk, and then they would, then they would fall over dead. So we have the, that's the origin of the whole living dead thing. Um, and then the, the third story uh, were all these tales coming back from explorers from um, South America about bats that drank blood. Okay, vampire bats. So, which is true, and I'll talk about that more in just a second. But he combined those three together into Dracula. It is a story that has lived now for over a hundred years, and as a matter of fact, is, is taking new flight, as I described earlier, um, with on television, et cetera. So, it's just something about that drinking blood that really gets to us. And you know, it's no, it's no different than eating a steak. You know, you know, I mean, really, a rare steak. I mean, we're, we're so abhorrent about it, but, but we do it all the time, you know, except for those who are vegetarians, okay. So, all right. Okay, and, and of course, um, movies has made a, a huge deal. This is Bela Lugosi. I mean, I still remember when I was going to see the original Dracula movies, et cetera, and scared the whatever out of me. <clears throat> anyway. Okay, and this is, uh, this is the way uh, that we that uh, we sort of think of bats in this kind of horrible depiction, you know, when we go to bed at night and, and, uh, and if we think about that. Um, and, and biologists over the, over the, um, the last uh, uh, half century haven't done bats a, a, a big favor because this is the way, if you saw a, a picture of a bat even in a science journal or in, in, in some book, this was almost always the way that they, they were depicted. I mean, after all, if I picked you up, pinned your arms back like that and held you, and I was, you know, a thousand times bigger than you were, you would be going <laughs> as well, okay? Although you have really puny canines, so it wouldn't be a very person, but that, that was the way, okay? so. <clears throat> 
So this was the state, this was where bats were sort of in the early 80s, is, is, is that they were being very poorly represented in, in, in almost every regard. And along came a gentleman, and this is Merlin Tuttle, who was the founder uh, and the president for over 25 years of Bat Conservation International. He's now the uh, emeritus um, president, I think, or something like that. Anyway, he's writing his, uh, his memoirs right now. And, and Merlin and I were uh, office partners in graduate school at the University of Kansas, and we worked together on bats in, 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 uh, in the late 60s. And uh, Merlin is uh, taking a bat out of a, out of a mist net, and I'll talk about mist nets in a few minutes. But what Merlin realized, and he had been working on bats since he was in high school and in, in the eastern Tennessee, and he'd been working on the gray bat, which is the most numerous cave bat in eastern North America. And uh, anyway, Merlin uh, figured out somehow that the way to conserve bats uh, was to change people's perceptions of bats. And since Merlin was already a really good photographer, uh, his idea was to use photography, and he is a scientist, but he has a PhD in ecology, and, but his idea was to start an organization and, which he did in 1984, uh, and he moved it. He hated cold weather, and he, had, he was in uh, uh, Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin, and so he moved, he could have gone anywhere to start it, so he moved to Austin, Texas. Okay, so he's a little bitty skinny guy. Anyway, uh, and so, uh, so what he, 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 but he knew that, that this is what you need to do. And so he started taking pictures of bats that showed them as they really are. And this is one, this is a, this happens to be a flying fox, but, but you know, bats are by and large very attractive. Now there are pretty, some pretty bizarre looking bats, and I'll show you some, but the, but the fact is that, that bats are very attractive animals, uh, and they're not fearsome animals anyway. Here's another one. This is a, this is a, um, <clears throat> a silver-haired bat, which occurs here uh, in Salida. Uh, it's a bat that lives, it does not live in caves, it lives in trees, which uh, a lot of, quite a few bats do. Normally people think of bats and caves together, but, but the majority of bats actually don't live in caves. Um, here's another one. This is the most common uh, bat around here. This is a little brown bat, um, Epteskis fuscus. I'm not going to use scientific names, uh, but anyway. Uh, this is another one. This is probably the most beautiful bat in North America. This is a spotted bat. It occurs in western Colorado. It's also maybe the least known bat. 25 years ago, when I was working on bats, I think there were six specimens that had been collected total at that time. It's, it's much better known now, but it's a really quite a beautiful bat. So, so this is what Merlin uh, started to do. So before I, I, I go any further, I want to talk about just very, very briefly about how researchers, how do you, how do you catch bats? Okay. All right, well, this, I'm going to show you this slide again. Here's Merlin taking a bat out of a mist net. The mist nets are very much like those old black hair nets that women uh, used to use back, I mean, maybe still do, but, but they used to use them a lot, okay? Uh, and, uh, and, and this is what they're essentially like. The bat simply cannot pick him up. It, after all, uh, this works uh, really well even on bats that can echolocate. Not all, I don't know, I'll explain that in a minute, but not all bats echolocate. All right, but the fact is that we'll catch echolocating bats. They just can't pick it up. It's too thin. Okay, so they run. The other is a harp trap, and in a harp trap, see if this works, you have um, piano wires that run vertically like this, and there are two sets of them back to back, and once again, the bat cannot pick that up with its, with its uh, sonar. It hits it and it tries to hold on and it slides down into this bag and then it can't climb out of the bag, okay? And that's a very good way to, to, uh, to catch bats as well. The problem is that you have to cart these heavy things around, okay? Uh, and by the way, that's me right there, uh, 1968 in a cave in uh, eastern Tennessee and you see I had a beard then uh, and that's the same beard I have now, so. And, uh, um, and I'm happy to say that I'm still wearing the same size clothes I was wearing then. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I, I'm probably still wearing those same clothes anyway. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's the, other, the other issue, you know. I mean, I've been wearing blue jeans and T-shirts and these clothes, you know, since, whatever, four or five years old. Heck, I think I'm going to go out that way. Anyway, um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the details of bats. There are... 1,200 in species of bats worldwide, okay? Not just a few, worldwide, okay? And, and 
they, they comprise about a fifth of all mammal species. There are about 6,000 mammal species. If you put bats and rodents together, you have uh, uh, about almost 50% of all mammals. Okay? So there, there are a lot of species. Okay? Now there are uh, 47 uh, species in the United States, and there are 18 species in Colorado. So where are the rest of all these bats? Mostly in the tropics. Okay? That's where they are mostly, and I'll be talking about that as we move along. Okay, and the thing is, and what's really unappreciated about bats is the, is the uh, ecological services that bats provide. Well, what the heck is an ecological service? Okay, <laughs> water, I'll give you an example without using bats. Water is an ecological service that, that you don't have to pay, well, you do have to pay for it now, but originally you didn't have to pay for it. Now, it only becomes when ecological services get stressed, too many people using them, polluting them, or whatever, you suddenly have to start paying for them. But those are, water takes care of all kinds of things for you. It cleans the air, it does all kinds. Of, well, bats do a lot of things as well. They control insects, they pollinate, they disperse seeds, things that I'm going to go into some detail with as, as I move along. Okay, well, this is a flying fox. This, this, uh, this bat has about a five-foot wingspan. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but what I, the reason I'm showing you this picture is because it shows you the, 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 uh, the scientific name for, for bats as a group is Chiroptera. And that means hand wing, okay? And that's its thumb. That's just, this is just like a regular human arm with extended digits here. So here you have the humerus, uh, this is, a, this is the uh, thumb up here, and then these are the digits out here, and that uh, allows it to expand this big membrane. A lot of bats do the same thing here in the back leg, in which they have a little bit of piece of cartilage that allows them to expand that. So there's a lot of variation uh, in, those, <clears throat> in those. Two groups of bats, the megachiropterans, which is the big the big bat hand wings, and the microchiropterans. This is a megachiropteran. Megachiropterans are only 60 species in the world. They, they live only in the old world tropics, i.e. Africa to Australia. Um, and they, they form normally large tree colonies. They do not live, uh, most of them do not live in caves. There are a few species that will go in caves, but, but most of them uh, do not, okay? The other group, um, which are the, oh, and, and by the way, the, mega car, the flying foxes eat only fruit, okay? And they eat uh, uh, fruit, and which includes the seeds, and they also will lick pollen off their face, which is high in protein, et cetera. But, but they're strictly, and this one, you can't really see it on this one, but he's got a mouthful of fruit right there. Yeah. Okay. This is the, 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 the bats that we're familiar with, and, and the, the one that's, the, the, the other, 1,150 or so species are the microchiropterans. They're not all micro. Um, there are some that are really, really small and only weigh as much as a penny. Uh, but, and the largest one only has a two-foot wingspan, so they're not nearly as big as the, as the, uh, the megachiropterans. 70% um, of the microchiropterans are insectivores, okay? And, and, and uh, this particular one here uh, this is the Mexican free tail bat, uh, and the Mexican free tail, we have Mexican free tail bats here. They like to get in houses, so if you've got bats in your house, that, that may be uh, one of them. And I'll talk, we'll talk a little bit, uh, and Raquel will talk about a little bit about um, um, bats in houses a little later. Um, but uh, these are also the bats that are at the uh, Orient Mine, and uh, I can't remember, I think, the, I think the exit flight there is about 65,000. Anybody remember? I think that's about what it is. That's a, uh, if you're used to Bracken Cave with 20 million or so, it's not quite as impressive. Uh, but it's still really worth the trip and, and really worth it. That is by, incidentally, that is the northernmost colony of Mexican free tail bats. And it's principally what they call a bachelor colony. It's almost all males. Okay? And, they, and all the Mexican free tails spend their winters in Mexico. You know? Hence the name. Okay? But this is a, this, this bat is like a little jet fighter plane. If you look at the way its wings are shaped, et cetera, it, it looks very much like a falcon, 
okay? And it flies very quickly, about 35 miles an hour. It feeds normally, well, it will feed anywhere from ground level to 10,000 feet, okay? And I'll talk about that more in a few minutes, okay? Okay, the thing you, when you hear about bats, the thing you think about is echolocation. Um, about 70% of all bats are insectivores, and so about 70% of all bats uh, echolocate. And uh, essentially what they're doing is uh, using high-frequency sounds. Um, you know, sound uh, it travels at, a, I think it's a 754 miles per hour or something like that. It's about a half uh, a mile a second. And uh, so what they do is they send a, a sound, which they make uh, with, their, uh, with their vocal cords. It's like a, you make sound. It goes out, hits an insect, and it bounces back. Um, and uh, and that is, uh, that's the, the manner in which uh, they're able to perceive where uh, an insect is. Not only perceive where it is, but which direction it's going, what size it is, uh, whether they want to, by the size, it lets them know whether they want to eat it or not. And they also will pick up sounds that are being made by the insect. Now there's a, a really interesting evolutionary war going on there because some insects uh, evade, when they feel that sonic uh, sound coming at them, they'll just close their wings and drop. Okay, like a rock. Or they'll send back uh, a counter sound to confuse the bats. So uh, some really, really interesting evolutionary things that we don't have much time to talk about. Okay. Okay. Uh, bats come in a lot of different colors. I mean, when you ever think about bats, you usually think about gray and brown or something like that. But they're, you know, uh, this is a, a white bat uh, here, red bat. By the way, this uh, little uh, red bats occur here. Um, and I've forgotten what kind of bat that is, but it's, it's an African species. I want you to notice some of the things that uh, you'll notice a big variation in ear sizes, which you're going to see again more, and, and in the size of the nose. I'll talk about it in a second. I also come in a lot of different shapes and, and, and different sizes. And uh, this bat here, which my wife tells me is her favorite bat, uh, it's an embalanurid. And what it can do, it, see this skin down here that's over its mouth? When it, hangs upside down and goes to sleep, it grabs the skin and pulls it up over its head. <laughs> but it can see through the skin. Now, nobody, I mean, you can speculate all day about why it can, can do it, and I don't know why. It maybe just looks sexy to female bats, whatever. But the females do it too, so I don't know. It work both ways. Okay, but here's the bat I want to use to illustrate something. Okay, if you're using sound, this is an, in, this is an insect eating bat. If you're using sound uh, for, to gather your food, uh, you will develop special adaptations. Well, obviously, the bigger your ears are, you know, I mean, you, what, what, you know, if you can't hear, what do you do? You do, you do this. You, you increase the size of your ears or, or you put hearing aids in. <laughs> Okay, uh, but so there's a lot of variation in ear size and really big, but what's this, okay? Well, it, it in part could be to deflect sound into the ears, okay? Because different sounds coming to the ears will tell you direction and movement, etc. But the other thing is, it's putting out sound. And some bats put sound out through their mouths, and other bats put sound out through their noses, okay? This bat puts sound out through its nose, okay? So that nose uh, 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 spade, or whatever you want to call it, lancet, whatever, uh, is... Uh, uh, is both used in, in the directing sound and in directing sound in, into the ear. So, so there's a lot of that. It, it may, however, be that uh, it's also associated with sexual selection. That is, that it may be that females choose males based on some of these secondary sexual characteristics, much so, in the way, let's say, that cars are for moving you from place to place at a certain speed. But if you put big tires on it, turn up your woofers, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, then it's beginning to play a secondary role. You get you someplace and someplace else maybe too, okay? It, you know, or you can do it another way. You just get, you know, uh, a BMW or a Mercedes or something like that. You know, so we have a lot of different ways and secondary sexual characteristics. Okay, now the thing about bats is small rodents reproduce rapidly. Bats, no matter what their size, are slow reproducers. And normally the average number of young for a bat is one. Okay, now fortunately they live, compared to rodents, they live a very long time. And we've captured bats that were 30 years old. Small bats. Now, if it's 30 years old and it's small, it means it's probably hibernating eight months a year. 
because that's the only way that life gets extended for that sort of animals. Okay, but very few species. Uh, this is a flying, this is a small flying fox uh, with a young. Um, here's a, uh, here's a eastern red bat which occurs in, in, uh, in Colorado. Uh, she has two young uh, right there. This is another bat that if you, if you wanted to find these bats you would walk along the river and look up in the trees. And I have a friend who worked on red bats and he walked around like this for so many years that now he has uh, all of his uh, cervical vertebrae infused, okay, from, you know, walking around for too many years like this and can't do it. Okay. Uh, this is Bracken Cave again, the cave I started off with. And um, you really can't see it, unfortunately. There's a, a person standing there, and he's tiny. So this is a huge cave. Everything you see there is a baby bat. Okay? There are millions and millions of bats that are this close together. Okay? Now there's, there's a mother bat right there. And... Um, this is, a, there's a French word, it's called a creche, okay, uh, which is a, a, a nowadays means a, a group of, of babies that are together being normally protected by uh, one or two uh, mothers. But the original meaning uh, for that term was a, a home for foundlings, okay, uh, in the French. So, anyway. Um, the, uh, what the females do is, this, this is probably why they come out two hours early, you know, in the evening. Uh, it's like, oh my God, get me out of here. Uh, okay. And uh, anyway, um, the, uh, uh, these bats, when the mother comes in, they, they thought for a long time that the females just came in and fed any bat. Okay? They just couldn't. It, they just could not conceive that these bats were actually finding their own youngster. And they did some very fancy studies, and it turns out that 80% of the time, I mean, the babies are all grab a teat. I mean, they're just, it's a scramble for a teat. And uh, um, the, uh, and that, so anyway, they found out that 80% of the time they, the mothers find the right baby. The, ba the mother produces a sound when she's coming in, uh, and then the baby produces a sound, and 80% of the time they find one another. 20% of the time she feeds another young. Once the young gets a teat, and bites those teeth into it, it ain't going, it's just going to feed it. So, it's, uh, okay. Okay. so this is the world's smallest bat. It's about as much as a penny. It's a, one of the, it's a microchiropteran, um, and it's in Thailand, kitties, hognose bat. You know, we're, humans always want to know what's the smallest of something or what's the biggest of something. You know, we're, we've got this problem. Anyway, and this is the largest flying fox. It's got a, a, almost a seven-foot wingspan. Okay. There are some relatively small flying foxes, but the smallest ones have about a one-foot wingspan. Okay. And as I mentioned already, this is another flying fox, and as I said, uh, they, uh, they're strictly fruit and seed eaters. Okay. Microchiropterans, on the other hand, um, are strictly insectivorous, and the thing I want to emphasize here is that when they are feeding young, they will eat 60% of their weight in an evening. Okay, think about that, you know, I mean, um, if you were eating 60% of your weight, you would, you know, would definitely have a bellyache, okay? Uh, and uh, so anyway, that, uh, but this has uh, big ramifications uh, in terms of the control of insects, because if, if, uh, if you have a colony of 100,000 or a million or 2 million bats, each one eating 60% of its weight or not, even though it may only weigh 20 grams or something like that, um, that's a tremendous number of insects, and I'll talk about that again in a second. Now, I said 70% I said of them eat uh, insects, but then the other 30% do some interesting things, and unfortunately, you really can't see this slide as well as I would like. This right here was chosen by National Geographic as one of the 100 most spectacular photos, nature photos ever taken. And as a matter of fact, they put it on page two of their book of the 100 most famous photos. So I think they ranked it higher than that. And that bat is coming in, it's got its mouth wide open, that's a frog right there, okay? So I, I, I think you probably see it. If you haven't seen it, you can go on the web uh, and see it anytime, but it's gonna grab a frog. Uh, this one, uh, is carrying a, a big uh, uh, centipede right there. That's a, a, a bat that actually lives in southwestern Colorado, around Durango. And this one, unfortunately, I've got a better picture of this one. This one has got a fish 
in, in back feet that are highly specialized to drag through the water and grab feet. Okay, now you're thinking, <laughs> you know, the probability is pretty low here. It must have been a lot of time dragging its feet. But what it does, you, you note that uh, it has its mouth open. That's its mouth right there. It's echolocating, okay? So what's it echolocating? Fish are below water. It's echolocating ripples, okay? And it knows those ripples, a certain shape of those ripples, there's a fish there, and it uses those long claws to, to snag fish, okay? So very specialized bat. Um, it, uh, it lives, and some of them live, uh, some of them feed in the ocean, some of them feed in fresh water, et cetera. So very, very specialized. This is the bat, of course, that everybody, when they think of bats, uh, this is a vampire bat. Um, there are only three species of vampires in the world. They all live in Latin America. Uh, two of them specialize on birds. And, um, and then one specializes on mammals. Now, this is the one um, that, this is actually a mammal um, feeding a vampire. But we had had it uh, in captivity for a couple of days, and it was really hungry. And we wanted to get some pictures of it. And so we were in this little village in French Guiana, and the guy we were staying with um, had four chickens. And believe me, those chickens were valuable to him because the plane only came in every couple of weeks with supplies. And those chickens laid eggs. And you had to vie for those eggs, OK? And, uh, and so we borrowed one of his chickens. That's a, that's a chicken foot right there. And then we had it in an uh, in an enclosure um, and uh, with uh, red lights so that the chicken, you know, when you, when you put, chickens can't see at night very well at, at all. And uh, the chicken calmed down immediately and we let the uh, vampire loose in there and he immediately uh, found the, the chicken and went over. And, uh, and they don't, they don't, vampires do not suck blood. They make a painless incision, and I'll show you some very specialized teeth in a second, painless incision, and then they sit there and lap the blood. They have an anticoagulant in their mouth. And by the way, some of you have probably been on uh, um, drugs, uh, anticoagulant drugs, et cetera, and those were based on work done on vampires, okay? And uh, so anyway, this, and, and the other thing that I noticed that the vampires do, they snuggle, snuggle at the leg of the chicken, you know, like they rub their head against it. And I, and I thought, well, that's what baby chicks do. And I really think that vampires have evolved to sort of calm animals down by giving them a little rub while they're drinking a little blood. And, and they, don't, uh, you know, they, they don't take enough blood uh, for it to really be injurious to the animal unless you get a lot of vampires going on like a single cow or something like that. Then they can't actually take enough blood to, to really hurt the cow. Okay. Um, so anyway, this is... Uh, I, I was there for this, this photo, okay, for a couple of photos actually, but there, this one I was there for. And by the way, when we finished with the bat and we were ready to go, Merlin caught the bat. He has a kind of a warped sense of humor, and he had the bat in, in his gloved hand, and, uh, and he took it out, and we had a bunch of villagers sitting around on kind of like bleachers right this. And, and of course, the lights are out, just a red light in the thing, he takes it over and says, Do you want to see it? And they went kind of like, you know, Yes. Most of them had scars on their arm for vampires because they get drunk. And that, that's why most people sleep in, in uh, uh, mosquito nets at night. Not for mosquitoes necessarily. Keep the vampires off, okay? And they, they get scars. You know, these people have uh, real uh, kind of dark skin. And so you can see very distinctive vampire scars where they got drunk or something, left a foot out or a hand out or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, he opened his hand and the vampire just sat there looking around. They're really smart. Vampires like looking around and then and everybody's kind of leaning back and then it just flew and it was bedlam. <laughs> just bedlam in there, you know. Here are these people that lived around vampires 24 hours a day, year after year, decade after decade, and they were scrambling like crazy, you know. And, and of course Merlin was laughing like crazy. Anyway, here's what the vampires look like. They have these, these two little teeth up here are uh, specialized incisors. They're not canines, they're incisors. And uh, that's what they make their, those little uh, bites with. Uh, they're also famous because they, they run around more, uh, almost more than any other bat. In fact, probably more than any other bat. They can run around the ground like a, kind of like a long-legged rodent. They're really kind of funny when they, they run around. Like, and they run around on the backs of cattle and other and deer and things like that uh, uh, similarly. 
but they're, they're, they're great animals. They're really smart. And so I, I couldn't find an old picture I have of like 10 little baby vampires kind of stacked on each other in a little pyramid. It was so cute, you'd want to go out and buy one tomorrow. I couldn't find the bloody thing. Anyway. Okay, uh, what about disease threats to humans from bats? There's only one, really, uh, and that's rabies. Okay. Uh, in the United States, uh, a single person dies each year from bat rabies. And by the way, they can tell there are different strains of rabies. So there's a skunk strain, there's a raccoon strain, there's a bat strain. So if you get rabies, uh, they can tell who you got it from. Fortunately, the prophylactic is 100% effective. Okay. The only people that die from rabies are people who don't come in for treatment or didn't know they were bitten or, or whatever. So we one, one person a year. Three people die every year from dogs. Uh, in the United States. Um, I had a whole list in which well, 40,000 from cars, 20% of whom due to drinking, da 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 da, it goes on. But the, the fact is that the, that the danger from bats uh, is, is extraordinarily uh, low uh, compared with a lot of things that we, that we put up with in terms of risk management of our own lives. So I won't, I won't dwell on that any longer. Okay, what are the ecosystem services provided by bats? Well, in addition, uh, well, I've already mentioned uh, the control of insects. Excuse me, the control of insects. But bats pollinate a surprising number of plants. A lot of the columnar cactus in the southwest are, are bat pollinated. Okay, uh, here you see. Uh, bats that do pollination have a really long tongue because they're going in there for the nectar and for the pollen. And you see this one has yellow pollen all over its face. That one has yellow pollen as well. Uh, here is a, a cutout view. Believe me, that bat was not happy about this picture. Okay, because we had to cut the flower in half and then take the bat and stick his head in there and take the picture. <laughs> not a happy bat. Okay. <laughs> okay. But here you can see the stamens, uh, pistil and stamens, right there, and, and, and so that, that's how the pollination occurs. Uh, this slide uh, shows uh, in the tropics, one of the, uh, the most important things that bats do is seed dispersal. And, and here you see a bat uh, on one of the most important of the tropical uh, fruits, uh, and that, those are figs. Uh, right there, and that, that occurs all the way from Latin America all the way through Australia, uh, that dispersal. Here's another one on eating a, a, a cactus fruit here, uh, and here's a, 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 a bat carrying off, a, a nut. I think that's a guava probably right there. Uh, this slide shows you just a few of the commercial fruits that bats uh, pollinate or disperse the seeds of. And right there is the durian, which is, I don't know if you, if you anybody had durian, durian experience? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you either, if you were born with it, you love it. Do you love it or it make you throw up? No? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I bought some durian cookies one time, and I took one little tiny piece of them. <laughs> but then we put them in the glove compartment and forgot about it. And we thought, I got in the car a couple of days later, and I thought, somebody threw up in the car. You know, I had students then, so it wasn't, you know, wasn't, wouldn't have been strange. And, uh, yeah, I had a student one time throw up in my shoes and put them back in the closet. That's how bad it anyway, anyway, that's another story. Uh, anyway, uh, so durian fruit, very, very valuable. Southeast Asian fruit imported around. That's a jackfruit, the largest fruit in the world. Uh, uh, there's uh, bananas, uh, avocados. Um, okay, uh, that, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember some, some of these. Anyway, lots of fruits are pollinated or seed dispersed by bats. Uh, the uh, agave, uh, special agave for which uh, tequila is made, bat pollinated. And reforestation or tropical rainforest is very, uh, very important from bats. Think about bats is, and we know that they do this, and reason is you can take one foot square pieces of cardboard or anything and put them out there in the, in, the, in the night, in the evening, and the next morning pick them up. Okay, well there are, no bats, there are no birds flying out there at night, so any droppings that are on those cardboards are from bats. Okay, and it turns out that, it, especially in the tropics, birds are extraordinarily loath to, to cross open spaces. And, and, uh, and bats are not. Bats are flying at night, they don't have the sort of predators that birds do. And uh, so most of this early seed dispersal in tropical rainforests is due to bats. Okay. Um, that's just a tropical rainforest slide that you can't really see in this. 
Okay. Uh, the other place that, that uh, seed dispersal is particularly important by bats, and this was a big surprise to everybody, but it's in tropical savannas, mostly, uh, mostly flying foxes. Okay, so when you look at this, you know, you're watching TV and you see this wonderful scene, tropical savannas in Africa, uh, most of the plants out there are due to the uh, dispersal, seed dispersal of bats. And once again, same study method was, was used there. Okay, insectivorous bats, extremely important uh, in keeping crop and forest pests in check. We had no idea how, how important bats were uh, in this regard until uh, people started doing some really uh, very, very uh, fancy technical studies for which the equipment was only available relatively recently. Uh, but it's so important that they play a, a major economic role in reducing the, the, uh, the numbers of uh, pesticides that have to be used uh, uh, on, crop, uh, on crops and, and of course in, in also similarly uh, protecting human, uh, 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 human lives, etc. in reducing the numbers of those. Okay. Uh, the free-tailed bats that are coming out of Bracken Cave uh, go into a, an eight county region in south central Texas and the average annual value just to the cotton industry, not to any others, is almost a million dollars. Okay, Those bats leaving Bracken Cave every evening are eating over a quarter of a million pounds of insects every night. Okay. Now, I didn't know if I believed that number, so I, took, I, I looked up the gram weights of, of Mexican free tails and 60%, you know, and then I, I, you know, I did all the calculations. Well, it turned out it was, way, it was like 325,000 pounds a night, but I thought I'd just use the 250. Anyway. Okay. The other thing that bats, this, this is something that no one believed would happen. Uh, and that is that there's a, anybody uh, been to Congress Avenue Bridge in, uh, in Austin? You know, they, they, well, there, the ho there's there are, uh, hotels all over here, <laughs> okay, lining that. And, and you have to book months and months ahead to get a room there during the time that the bats are emerging, okay? It's a huge tourist draw. And there's only like a million bats under that bridge. When, when Bat Conservation International came there in the mid 80s, they were about to, to seal all of those cracks up so those nasty bats wouldn't be there. Okay? It was, a, you know, and, and I, I don't think there's probably no other city in the United States that's had such a turnaround in terms of its view of bats as Austin, Texas. Okay? Um, and so uh, it's quite spectacular to go there. So if you're ever in Austin during the summer, make sure you go down to Congress Avenue Bridge. It's only about half a mile down the road uh, from the um, um, cap state capitol, right there on that same street. Might call it Congress Avenue. Okay, well, the fact is that despite a lot of really, really good things, bats do need our help. Uh, and and, and the, uh, the things that suggest that are the fact that about half of the uh, 47 U.S. species are on the priorities concern list. I mean, uh, the state um, uh, wildlife agencies are concerned with what's going on with those bats. Um, many species are susceptible to decline and local extinction, uh, so on and so forth. And they, they do merit our protection, and they merit a sort of a, I consider it a wise view of another species, of other species that we, in, that we, uh, that we share this, uh, this earth with? Well, they do a lot of things that make for one is that many live in caves. And the fact is that almost everybody want, not everybody, but lots of people want to go in caves, okay? And when they get in caves, they scare the bats out. And if it's winter, bats store, only store up enough fat to make it through the winter. If they're, com if they're continually aroused, they burn that fat off and they will die before the, uh, before the springtime comes. They have limited reserves. They're very slow reproducers. And many of the forest species require very special roost situations. A lot of them go in, in old uh, uh, empty snags and hollows and trees, etc. Well, you know, when people buy a piece of property, they go, oh, well, that tree's got a nasty old rotten spot in it cut that down, so on and so forth, you know. So we see a lot of destruction uh, th for, through forestry, uh, 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 whatever you would call it, uh, uh, management uh, prescriptions um, that they end up destroying a lot, inadvertently destroying a lot of bat roots. 
Okay, uh, we, we have other, you know, just general habitat destruction, disturbance in caves, mine closures. There are, what I don't remember how many mines there are in Colorado, um, and maybe Raquel will mention that, but, but, you know, there are thousands of mines. A lot of those have bats in them. Okay, and so now, fortunately, uh, Bat Conservation International actually started this uh, this mine uh, mine initiative where they where they uh, look at uh, make sure bats are not in there before they close them. Then you have wind energy development. If done the right way, it's not much of a threat. If done the wrong way, it's a big threat. There are migration corridors for bats. And then, last but not least, we have uh, we have other ones uh, that that you could uh, easily figure out. Um, we have. Uh, Cave modification, where people are, are uh, commercializing caves. Land conversion, where people are simply cutting down forests to, to, uh, to uh, raise other crops, et cetera, or to build houses and buildings. And then a lot of these old buildings have uh, bats in them as well. And people, you know, uh, renovate buildings, just tear them down, lots of other reasons. Um, things you can do to, uh, to conserve and protect bats. Uh, one, you can leave old snags and and um, and, and other um, and other possible bat roosting places. Uh, check abandoned buildings, and this is stuff that Ra Raquel's going to talk on, so I'm going to go very quickly. A lot of these buildings have bats in them. Not obvious. You can exclude bats in an appropriate manner. If you just call the local pest control person, they are generally not going to know how to exclude bats without killing them. Okay, so keep that in mind. If you have bats. Uh, you can always go on the Bat Conservation International website um, and check with them, and, and they can usually recommend somebody locally. And that might be something that Gorna might consider doing, is maybe having um, someone we could recommend who we have put through some, whatever, an enlightening program. And there may be somebody here already who's great at it, I don't know, but generally that's not, that's not the case. Uh, provide alternative housing um and uh to prom uh, support and promote policy to protect cave and mine roofs uh, i already talked i already mentioned uh uh wind uh wind energy development it can be done uh correctly uh last but not least uh, and this is a slide that got in the wrong place but the biggest threat to bats right now especially in eastern north america is white nose syndrome all these blue things are hibernacular area this is a threat to cave dwelling bats um, it's already killed millions and millions of bats. It's a brand new disease. It's a fungus that the bats get when they're in the caves. Um, grows a white fungus growth on their face, and it simply robs them of enough energy to make it through the winter. And um, uh, I, you can this this is actually off, right off the web, um, but uh, this is the areas which really knocked out large numbers of bats. And uh, right now we have policies uh, in Colorado to protect bats, uh, not allowing people into certain caves, et cetera. This is, uh, th this is uh, some details about it, but I, I won't go into that. You can look that up real easily off the web. Um, already six million bats killed, and that was in uh, January 2012. I think that's up by about two million bats. 90% mortality. Um, it affects a large number of cave-dwelling bats. Okay, back to the slide. I, I know I showed it before. It's not an age issue. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm showing this is because, you know, this is the kind of relationship we want to develop, see developed with bats, and that is what I'd call a reasonable relationship. There's so many humans on this planet today that we can no longer take what I view as an almost 40 or 50s American attitude with, ooh, eek. You know, I, nothing drives me crazier than the ooh, eek thing. I, I used to have students in the, um, uh, for uh, seven years I had students in very, very far-flung paces and stuff like that. And, and one time it drove me to the point where we turned a log over and there was a cockroach, but it was a wood roach. You know, it was a really beautiful species of roach. And I got a lot of ooh eeking and I, it bothered me so bad I just took the roach and flipped it in my mouth. And, um, and uh, one of the women said, you, you didn't put it in your mouth, and I said, "Yep, I opened my mouth, and it just—it was like it was like it was trained. It crawled out across my beard and across my face." Okay, so, so don't drive me to do something like that. Okay, I'm just asking you. So anyway, I I tried to, uh, um, I went about five minutes over here. So, um, but I, you know, I'll, I'll take a few questions. And and by the way, I, uh, I, I live in Salida now. And I, you see me. Uh, 
uh, in uh, any of the local places. Uh, feel, uh, you know, you can grab my grab me and, and ask me about bats or anything else any other time. So, so I had to take a few questions. The picture that you showed in the nursery with all little babies and one mother. So there's twice as many bats as we saw in that picture because there was like only, you know, there's like 25 babies and one mother. So each one of those has a mother. Each also. one has a mother. Yeah. Yeah, each one has a mother and one, they each have one baby. Yeah. Other questions? Hi. We um, were able to get to the Orient Land Trust cave last fall it was be toward the end of the season and we're just amazed. So I would recommend anybody who has a chance to go do that, please do. Um, that's a bachelor colony there, is that true? The Orient Land Trust? Yes. Yeah, it's a bachelor colony. Didn't mean there's not a few females in there maybe, but... But I was curious about why you'd have female colonies in one place and bachelor colonies in another and how they get themselves together. When they go to Mexico... <laughs> What happens in Mexico doesn't leave Mexico. <laughs> and by the way, they, they breed in the cave. Um, they do not breed. Uh, there may be bats. They, there's been speculation there's some bats that breed on the, um, on the wing, but, but I don't know of anybody that's ever proven that. But generally, it's a, with those bats, it's in the cave. Like, yeah, they, what is a rec do you have any recommended ways to get you know, bats? You know, what you do is you put a one-way flap. I'm, I'm just going to generalize, but you put a one-way flap uh, that the bats can push through to get out, and then they can't get back in. That's the easiest way. The problem is they can go through the tiniest little crack, okay? So old houses really have a problem with bats, and there have actually been a few really wonderful cases where houses have collapsed because they gathered so much guano in the, in the attic that the whole house fell down, <laughs> which is one of my favorite stories. Um, what's their lifespan? Lifespan. Uh, the the uh, um, uh, flying foxes usually live about six to twelve years, but some of the little bats they probably normally don't live more than about five or six years, but some can live up to twenty twenty five years. Okay. Um, Similarly, it's just in a way a little bit like hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are an amazingly long-lived. There's some wonderful research that's going on up at Gothic near Crested Butte where they've, they've uh, uh, captured uh, migratory hummingbirds that are like 11 and 12 years old. And you wouldn't think something. And that's because when they go to sleep at night, they go into torpor, which is like a daytime hibernation. Um, with the, the picture that you showed... Um, the bat swooping down to catch the fish. Uh huh. Like, is that a really big bat or is it a really small fish? <laughs> it's a really small fish. <laughs> okay, we're just gonna do one. Yeah, it's a it's a minnow. Yeah, we we don't have to worry about that with uh, like taking trout, um, which which with all bats would be killed in Colorado if that happened. <laughs> How many bats did you say were in um, that cave in Austin? Somewhere between, probably close to 20 million. That's, that's the best guess. They've, they've, they've been trying for years to figure out all kinds of fancy technology to get the number of bats, but, but they have not really been able to nail that one down. Problem is they go in a circle when they come out of a cave, a vortex of bats, and usually in the air at any one time, must be 30 or 40,000 at any one time. It takes four, it takes two hours for them to all leave and they all sort of, sometimes they'll sort of just calm down and then go like, if you ever have a chance, you know, go down there, it's, it's, it's worth the trip, at least for me. Yeah. Okay, well thank you very much, appreciate it. <laughs>